The following resource is from DesiringGod.org. Romans, the very first chapter, from the 14th through the 17th verses. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. Father, you are so holy. Holy, holy, holy. Set apart. Pure. Not willing to look upon sin. Infinitely valuable. One of a kind. And we tremble before your holy word. Forbid that I or any of us in this room right now would trifle with it. Oh God, this is a holy moment. Eternal and infinite things are at stake in these moments as they have been in moments gone by. And I call for your Holy Spirit to rest with a kind of weight upon this congregation as we take up weighty matters. Let none be glib or trivializing of this moment or this word, I pray. Come, grant minds to understand and hearts to respond with affection and love and obedience and joy to you. Help me, Father, to open this word for the glory of your gospel of grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Verse 16 says... The gospel is the power of God unto salvation or for salvation to everyone who believes. Now back on June 21st, I argued, I gave you four reasons why that does not mean the gospel is the power of God to convert people. Though it is the power of God to convert people but rather means the gospel is the power of God to take believers, keep them, and get them through judgment into everlasting joy and safety before an awesomely holy God. And what I did not make plain in that message was why we need saving. And so let me take a moment here from the wider context of Romans to make sure you understand why at the very outset here Paul brings up the issue of salvation. Why do we need it? Look at verse 18 for the first answer. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the first reason, and it's the main reason in the book of Romans why we need salvation is because of the wrath of God. God is angry at our unrighteousness and the way we take the truth and suppress it, step on it, keep it hidden, distort it, twist it, so that we can justify the way we want to live. God's angry at our way of living. Or, let your eye run down into chapter 2, verse 8. To those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth... 
but obey unrighteousness. Now notice, those are the same two words from verse 18 of chapter 1. Rejecting truth and embracing unrighteousness. Same two words, truth and unrighteousness. They will be rendered wrath and indignation. There it is again. Wrath and fury, the RSV says. So the answer of the book of Romans so far is we need salvation because God is very, very wrathful against our unrighteousness. Run your back, run your eyes back up into verse 5 of chapter 2. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now here he adds that little phrase to wrath, righteous judgment. In other words, God's wrath is righteous wrath. It's not like our wrath. We Anger in the human heart is all out of whack. Which is why the Bible says so many times, don't be angry. Be slow to speak, slow to anger. The anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. You aren't good enough to get mad. Only God is good enough to get mad. And he's really mad at the unrighteousness of people and the way we handle the truth and distort it and suppress it. And there's coming, he says in verse 5 here, a day of wrath. Verse 18 says, it's now falling in part. It is being revealed now in part. But there's coming a day, believe me, when there won't be any confusion anymore about the wrath of God. People will hide themselves in mountains and caves and plead to be crushed like in Nairobi. Lest they have to see the Lamb face to face. That's what Revelation says is coming. So that's why we need salvation. Because we're all going to enter that day. And everybody in this room is unrighteous. No exceptions. So we need saving from that. That's the main thing we need saving from. If you ask the book of Romans, now tell me, book of Romans, why are you bringing up salvation? What is the reason you're talking about saved? Saved from what? The answer of the book of Romans is, yes, you need saving from sin. Yes, you need saving from guilt. Yes, you need saving from broken relationships. Yes, you need saving from bondages of all kind. But mainly, in the end, you need saving from the wrath of God. So the gospel, according to verse 16, is the power of God to rescue you from the wrath of God. This is strange and wonderful. The gospel is the good news that God rescues sinners from God. Look at chapter 5, verse 9, to see salvation and wrath brought together in a climactic way. Chapter 5, verse 9, one of the most important verses. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, by Jesus' blood, we shall be saved. You see, let me just stop there in the middle of the sentence and, and make sure. Most people in this room probably have heard the, the language of salvation as something that happened to you when you believed in Jesus. I got saved. Now, that's true. That's biblical. But that's not the main way that the Bible uses the term salvation, especially in the book of Romans. The main way is out there in the future when we've got to face the righteous judgment of God. Will we be saved there from the wrath of God? And now this verse addresses that. We read again, verse 9, chapter 5. Much more than having now been justified. Oh yes, there is a glorious present experience of being right with God. But that just gets us ready to be saved. From what we really need to be saved from, and that is the wrath of God at the judgment day. 
We shall be, it says, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. So, going back to clarify, June 21, the reason verse 16 is so concerned about salvation, the reason the book of Romans is so concerned about salvation, is because we need saving mainly from the righteous wrath of God at the judgment day. Will we make it? When we face the fiery judgment of God at the last day, will there be any asbestos around us so that we can pass through it, behold it like a hurricane of glory and enter into joy? Or will we be consumed? like chaff. Well, that's a big issue. And it is addressed now. And the question this morning is, how does the gospel save believers? How does it do that? How does it save you from that? Now, here's the way I want to go about it. I want to unpack verse 17 today. We're on verse 17 today. And we will be on verse 17 two more weeks. And the way I want to begin by walking into this, this verse that's running neck and neck with a few other verses in Romans for the most important verse in the Bible, which is why it's worth three weeks at least, is to translate it wrongly for you. I'm going to read it and I'm going to read it wrong in order to highlight what's there and then ask, why is it there? Sometimes to throw what's there into stark relief by reading what's not there and you might think would be there is a way to waken you to what is there and begin to appropriate it for your soul. So here's my wrong reading. Verse 16, I'll start back there. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the love of God is revealed from faith to faith. That's not what it says. And yet, that's the emphasis that most of us have when we describe the content of the gospel. So here is Paul standing, giving the thematic two verses of the whole letter about the gospel. And as he begins to unpack how the gospel has power, how it saves, how it works... He does not say, for in it the love of God is revealed. Which would be an absolutely true statement. No mistaking. Chapter 5, verse 8, for example. God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. It would not be wrong to say... The gospel is the power of God unto salvation because in it the love of God is revealed to us. I wouldn't be wrong. It's just not what he says. And therefore we need to ask, why didn't he say that? Why did he say what he did say? Now the reason I'm starting this way, to call attention to what he did say like this, And to put it over against love like that is twofold. I have two reasons for doing this. Reason number one is to make plain that the love of God does not trifle with unrighteousness and wrath. The love of God does not sweep the wrath of God and the unrighteousness of man under the rug and say, I'm nice, I feel nice to human beings, I'm going to be nice to you. Let's just let bygones be bygones. Good. On into eternity. Close the book. Verse 16 is enough. 
You don't need the whole book. Sixteen chapters. The love of God is a huge thing. It's a room. No, not a room. It's a house, a building, a castle. And when you open the door of it, and that's what Paul is doing in verse 17 and 16 chapters, he opens the door of the love of God and he beckons us to walk into the building with him and go from room to room, the righteousness room and the wrath room and the justification room and the propitiation room and the substitution room and the deity of Christ room and the hell room and the heaven room and to see the whole scope of the love of God so that you come out at the other side breathless saying I never knew the love of God like it is held out in the book of Romans that's the first reason the love of God is huge. It is a love that is legal. It is a love that is right. It is a love that is true. It is a love that is just. It doesn't trifle with the biggest realities of the universe. It includes the biggest realities of the universe. It embraces all the other attributes of God. The love of God isn't over against the other attributes. The love of God sustains and upholds the other attributes of God. That's the first reason I mention this like I do. Here's my second reason. God does not come to us and say, I'm a nice God. And I feel nice to you. And so I'm going to be nice to you. Just believe that. That's not the way God talks. God comes to us with very great wrath. He is very angry at our unrighteousness and at us in our unrighteousness. And that, too, is part of the love of God. God's not loving on some days and angry on other days. Catch him on his loving day. You don't want to catch him on his bad day. That's not the way God is. My second reason for beginning this way is because and this happens when I go on vacation I, I, I stand back and I look at the church and I visit and I watch and I think and it is appalling how many Christians don't care about verse 17 thank you they just want to know verse 16 Tell me that there's good news that will save me and close the book. Thank you. I believe it. It's all I want to know. Now, there's something wrong here. Because Christ is alive. We agree on that? Christ is alive and he has called an authoritative apostle named Paul into his service to provide a foundation for the church of the living God. And he inspires him to write a book. Thirteen of them. And when he gets to verse 16, and Paul signs off on it is the power of God and salvation for all who believe, the Jew first and also the Greek, and starts to lay his pen down, Jesus says, I'm not done. I have 16 chapters to go. And when he says that, now this is plain. Kids, see if you can get this. See if this makes sense. If God tells us something, God wants us to know it. Is that plain? Any kid can't understand that? If God inspires his authoritative apostle to tell us things, he wants us to know them. I am not asking you to take a course in theology. 
I am asking you to care about verse 17. Is that fair? I am asking you to care. How does he save? How does he get me through wrath? How does he take a sinner like me, unjust, unrighteous, corrupt, through and through? He's holy. He can't look on sin. And yet, there's supposed to be some good news that gets me through wrath, through judgment, through his holiness, into his fellowship where I'm his friend and enjoying him forever and ever. God wants you to know how that happens. If he didn't want you to know that, he would not have Romans in the Bible. In fact, he wouldn't have a Bible. And I just plead with you, I am pleading with you this morning to be serious about the serious things in the universe. The big problems are not Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. The big problems are not tidal waves in Papua New Guinea and flooding in China and war in Pakistan. The big problems are not our kids strung out on drugs. The big problems are not kids killing each other in the city. The big problems are not thievery, divorce. Those are not the big problems. Those are the symptoms of the big problems. Romans is about the big problems. Unrighteous souls that are in rebellion against the living God and take every kind of manifestation of truth and twist it and bury it and suppress it and the wrath of God unleashed against that kind of unrighteousness. That's the big problem in the universe. Everything else is symptom. And so I'm pleading with you to take the book of Romans with me and a few years, you call it a course in theology if you want, but all I'm doing is going to be pointing you, pointing you to words and sentences. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for one reason and not another reason. What's the reason? Can you give an account to your child for why the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? Or let me bring it maybe even closer to home. Some of you are going to hear a doctor say, most of you will. We've done all we can do. And you're going to say with a trembling voice, How long do I have? And he's going to say, a week, maybe two. And then, in two weeks, God, holy, wrathful, righteous. And I promise you, In those two weeks, you're going to want to know this. You're going to want to know how it works. How does it apply to me? How do I get it? How can I be sure? You're going to wish you had listened. You're going to wish you had worked. And I'm just pleading with you now as a people that I love. I tell you, when I go away on vacation, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Up close, we see each other's warts and we get mad and upset about things. I get away from you people. I just love you so much. I want to be back. I want to preach. I want to visit. I want to care. I want to be there when your family breaks down and when you get sick and when you start to doubt. I want to be there for you. Romans is there as a gift, folks. This is a gift, and I want to be there now. I will come to you in those two weeks. We'll get all over you in those two weeks and help you die. We will. But today, today, you can get yourself so deeply ready. And next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, it's going to be a great ten years. So please, don't coast. 
Don't be passive. I know you've grown up passive. Many of you, you've grown up passive in the church and you've called theology something you don't want to do. And I don't care about theology books here. I care about verse 17 and the logical connection between it and verse 16 and how it will bring you to glory. If you know it, love it, hold on to it, live on it, feed on it, suck at the breast of verse 17 day and night and let the milk of the Word of God make you strong, make your bones unbreakable before the news of cancer or anything else. Well, those are my two reasons for starting the way I'm starting. I haven't even got to the main point yet. Which is, verse 17, here's my question. How does God save believers? Verse 16 says He does. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Now how? How, Jesus? How, God? I'm a sinner. I'm unrighteous. You're angry at me. What's the hope? That's what verse 17 is all about. Now, here's the answer. Let's just read it. I'm not reading from a theology book. I'm reading from the Bible. You better care about this sentence. It's God's Word. The gospel is the power of God and salvation because in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now this is a puzzle. This is a puzzle. Luther, Martin Luther, hated verse 17. He hated it. Until he got it. You know why he hated it? Some of you hate it. If you're thinking you'd hate it, I'm unrighteous. My problem is that God is righteous. Therefore, is this huge gulf of enmity and wrath between us. And you're telling me now it's good news that that righteousness is being revealed to me? Yeah, put a torch in my face. That's why he hated this. Let me read it to you just so you hear his own words. I had been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle to the Romans. But a single word in chapter 1, verse 17, stood in my way. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. For I hated that word, righteousness of God. Which I had been taught to understand is the righteousness with which God punishes the unrighteous sinner. Close quote. He hated it because there was no hope here for him. He hated the concept of the righteousness of God. He only had one category in his brain. I'm righteous. God's righteous. That's trouble. So how is it gospel? How does it save us? How does verse 17 get us through the wrath of God? Here's the answer. God demands righteousness and we don't have it. So our only hope, if there's going to be any hope, is that God would give to us the righteousness that He demands from us. And that's what verse 17 means. When it says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, it means we can't create our righteousness, we can't supply our own righteousness, we can't perform our own righteousness. We are so corrupt and fallen and depraved, there is no way any human being can pull himself up by his own moral bootstraps and present himself to God as a righteous trophy that deserves salvation. It'll never happen, not for a single human being on the face of the earth. We are all corrupt. He's going to take three chapters to prove this. So, what's the hope? 
And the hope is a righteousness of God that is demanded from us is offered to us to be received as a gift by faith. That's the gospel. Let me summarize the gospel for you in a sentence. Let's read it here in a paraphrase. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's verse 16. Because in it, God offers to us what he demands from us, namely his righteousness. God offers to us freely what he demands from us, his own righteousness. Now that verse is worth two more Sundays. I'll tell you why. And then I'm going to come back and close with Martin Luther. The first reason it demands another Sunday is this. I must ask with you, what is the righteousness of God that we so desperately need that He's willing to give to us? What is that? Is it the vindication of the justice of God in the punishment of a substitute? Chapter 3, verse 25. Or is it our right standing with God that we can enjoy as acquitted, forgiven, justified sinners, accepted and loved as a friend of God? Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 5, verse 1. All of chapter 4. Or is it the moral transformation wrought by the Holy Spirit whereby we from one degree to the next are conformed into the righteous image of the Son of God so that one day we will really be righteous and not just counted righteous. Or is it perchance all of them? That's next Sunday. And as I thought that through yesterday, I thought, yeah, but I got to get to this phrase. From faith, for faith. What's that? And I got to get to Habakkuk 2 4, quoted at the end of the verse. Is the RSV? Or the NASB or the NIV, who's got this thing right here? And how does it undergird the revelation of the righteousness of God that's going to get us saved in the end? So it's got to be three weeks. I just have to have three weeks on verse 17. That last Sunday, that third Sunday on this verse is all about how you get it. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What does that mean? From faith to faith. How do you get this thing? How do you hold on to it? How do you keep it? How do you make it your own? What makes you different from somebody else who hears it and goes on their merry way? So faith is a huge link up here that we've got to devote a Sunday to. But let me close like this. Martin Luther didn't always hate this verse. And I don't want you to hate this verse. I want you to love verse 17. I tell you, I have... I Thank you, Jesus, that I'm a pastor. I love what I do. Because you guys pay me to study the Bible. I cannot believe that I get paid to study the Bible. And to preach the Word of God. So I, I've spent hours and hours thinking about verse 17. And I feel so rich. I come down to the supper table and the lunch table and Noel has to hear me lengthen out my thanks for the food. <laughs> uh, going on about justification. and <laughs> hmm. I want you to love this verse. I want you to live in this verse and feed on this verse. I want you to die well with this verse. 
So I want you to hear the testimony of Martin Luther in the prayer that it will be your testimony and that some of you who walked into this room this morning not loving the righteousness of God and not loving God and not trusting Jesus and wanting to get out of here as soon as you could because you didn't want to be here in the first place will find yourself saying, uh, noon, it's one minute after right now, noon, August 9, 1998, I walked through the gospel into paradise. Let me read it for you. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at Romans 1.17. You picture him there in the castle at Württemberg, beating on his Greek New Testament. I don't get it. I don't get it. That's the way Luther was. You have to forgive the noise. And the... Luther was like that. He called people names. He used bad language. He was just a bad guy. Which is a wonderful thing because God saves bad guys like you and Luther and me. It's a great thing that our heroes are all bad guys, isn't it? It's a great thing. So he was beating on his New Testament. Importunately, and then he said, At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, that's what I'm pleading for, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context and the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written. He who through faith is righteous shall live. And there I began to understand that the righteousness of God is the righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered into Paradise itself through open gates. Oh God, do it for some in this room right now. If you get verse 17, that a holy God demands from you a sinner a perfect righteousness, is angry because you are so corrupt you won't give it. And then in mercy, devises a way at the cost of his son's life to give you the righteousness that he demands from you. That's good news. That will help you die. That will get you through two weeks of battling Satan as you move to the grave. And that will get you through this afternoon triumphant over temptation. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace with God through an exchanged righteousness that Jesus bought for you and God gave to you in the gospel. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Have a good week with Jesus. Thank you for listening to this resource from DesiringGod.org. If you found it helpful, we encourage you to enjoy and share from thousands of resources on our site, including books, sermons, articles, and more, available free of charge. DesiringGod.org exists to help you treasure Jesus more than anything else. Because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.